Before I begin this presentation, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to it. The information that you're about to hear is very powerful. It has changed many lives. But before we begin, I'd like to, I'd like to offer a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, our God, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. And we thank you for this opportunity to study and share your Holy Scripture. We pray that you will open our ears to hear your word, and our mind to understand them, and our hearts to carry your word into our daily lives. We also pray for your constant guidance, and we ask your continued blessings on this message so that it may impact each listener in a way that, we, that will be beneficial to your kingdom. I ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to stop for a minute and print a handout that we offer uh, it's going to be very important that you have this handout because we're going to refer to it several times while I'm speaking. If, uh, if you would go online to www.thefourthcup.com and look at the section that says handout and print it out, uh, it's nothing more than some compressed Bible verses that we've copied and pasted and put together so you don't have to flip through your Bible to find where we're reading. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. It's in PDF format. But please take the time to stop now, pause it, and... Uh, if you can, to print this handout, you're going to really find it useful as we go on with this study. This began with me several years ago when I was watching the movie, The Passion of the Christ. While I was watching the show, something was revealed to me. And what I mean by that is I instantly had a knowledge that I didn't gain through study. I hadn't heard it from anyone. But I knew there were some scriptures in the Old Testament that connected with, with the New Testament and I, I couldn't really figure it out. And nothing's ever been revealed to me before. But I had this knowledge. And I went back home and I opened up my Bible and, and uh, started highlighting and, and finding things. I studied for about a year, finding Old Testament verses and highlighting, comparing to the New Testament. After I had gathered quite a bit of information together, um, I went to see our local deacon because I was afraid that I was the only person in the world that had made these connections. And I was wondering, what am I reading? I kind of got scared. And I went to our local deacon, and I, I sat down and I made an appointment with him, and, and uh, I said, let me just show you some information I found in the Bible. And uh, it took about 20 minutes and explained it to him. And he, he backed away, and his, his eyes got big and said, Mike, I've never heard this before. And uh, he said, I'm, I'm not sure if it's something you ought to be studying, but it sounds like it is. Uh, you really need to go see a priest. So I went to see our local parish priest and went through the same process, and I'm explaining things to him. And, as I'm showing him this information that, that was revealed to me, I noticed he wasn't bored with me, but I noticed he knew the information. So I asked him, I said, Father, you've, you've seen this before. You know this, don't you? And he said, yes, Mike. I, I learned this when I was in the seminary. I learned this when I was becoming a priest. We teach this. How did you get it? And I explained to him how it was revealed to me while watching the movie, and I had studied for about a year. And he, he challenged me and told me, he said, Mike, this information was not given to you for your benefit alone but for you to share with other people. <laughs> First I said, Father, you know, I'm not the one with the authority to teach this. You're the priest. You're the one standing up in front, of, in front of the people in church. They all know who you are. I'm a car salesman. I'm just a father of, of a family. I'm a lay person in the church. By what authority do I have to teach something in the church? And, and he propped up and said, well, Mike, by the authority given to you in baptism, everyone is called to spread, God, spread God's message. So I asked several priests over the next few months, and each one told me that the information that I'm going to give you is actually the information that is considered the birth of the church. This is why the Catholic Church offers the Holy Eucharist every day in every Mass in 3,000 languages all over the world. And each one of them challenged me to go out and to spread this message and to share this message. And I asked them, by what authority do I have to give this message? And each one told me, by the authority given to me in baptism, I have, authority, I have enough authority to give this message. So I tell you right now, with the authority given to me in the waters of baptism, I step forward to bring you this message. First, I would like to begin by asking you two questions. One is, can you give an accurate definition of the phrase, Lamb of God? 
Now, we all know this is a, a name used for Jesus like Messiah, Savior, Son of Man, or, or the Christ. But exactly what is meant by the phrase Lamb of God, and why is it important to me as a Christian today? The second question I would like to ask you is, why would the Catholic Church offer the Holy Eucharist at every Mass throughout the world in over 3,000 languages? What knowledge does the Catholic Church have that would encourage them to do this? What information do they have why they would offer this for over 2,000 years? In answering these questions, we will see why the Catechism states that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. Just to say the words, Jesus died for me, this is a powerful statement. But today I want to focus on how he died for me. When we unveil God's master plan, your eyes will be opened, and you will begin to understand that how he died gave birth to the church, and it should be a very important part of our lives today. This begins with the familiar story of God and Moses. Remember the slaves that were in Egypt? They were enslaved in Egypt for several thousand years, the Israelites, and uh, Moses finds out that he's truly an Israelite, and he ends up killing a man, and he's banished across the desert. He goes over across the desert. He starts his life over. He's shepherding sheep. He begins a family and marries. And uh, one day, while he's shepherding sheep, he looks on a mountain, and he sees a, a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And he goes up to this bush, and God speaks to him and tells him to take off his sandals. He's standing on holy ground. And as he's talking to God, he explains that, that the Israelites had been enslaved for 400 years, and, and God says that he has heard their cries. So God sends Moses back to Egypt, and before he sends him, Moses says to him, um, there are a lot of gods in Egypt, the false gods. When I go back to Egypt, they're going to ask me what your name is. What am I to tell them? Now, if, if you printed your hand out, I'd like for you to get a pencil or, or a pen, and I'm going to ask you to circle a few words throughout this entire presentation so that you will connect, make some connections with them. Uh, if you look at Exodus 3, But said Moses to God, When I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, if they ask me what is his name, what am I to tell them? God replied, I am who am. Then he added, This is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am sent me to you. Take your pen or, or pencil and circle I am. We're going to see that later. So Moses goes back across the desert. He goes back to Egypt. He goes to Pharaoh and he says to let the people go. And Pharaoh, of course, didn't listen. So God sends a series of ten plagues on Egypt. And each plague of Egypt defeated one of the false gods in Egypt. For instance, the, the first plague, when, when the Nile turned red with blood, defeated the god of the Nile. And each plague after that defeated one of the false gods. Until the tenth plague, God sent the angel of death. This tenth plague was to kill the firstborn throughout their entire land. The firstborn of Egypt was to die. The firstborn of Israel was to die. The firstborn of the flocks, of the animals, the firstborn across the land is dead. Now, I don't know how many of you listening are the firstborn in your family, but the firstborn can be 90 years old, or the firstborn can be a small infant child. So God sends the angel of death, and he tells Moses there's a way that the Israelites can avoid the death of their firstborn. And he gives them a ritual that they're to perform, and if they perform this ritual, the angel of death would pass over their home. Now, we all know this story, but this is going to be very important later on, so listen closely. The Lord says to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall, be, shall stand as the head of your calendar. You shall reckon it in the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth of this month, every one of your families must procure it for itself a lamb. One apiece for each household. If a family is, is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join to the nearest household in procuring one, and shall share the lamb in a portion to the number of persons who partake it. You're to take a lamb on the 10th of the month, and, and he goes on to describe this lamb. 
This lamb must be a year old male and without blemish. Look down at Exodus 12. A year old male without blemish. Circle male without blemish. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. And then with the whole assembly of Israel present, it shall be slaughtered during the evening twilight. Circle evening twilight. You'll need to know that Bible scholars agree that evening twilight is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You might want to make a note of that there, 3 p.m. They shall take some of the blood and apply it to the two doorposts and to the lentil of every house in which they partake the lamb. That same night they shall eat its roasted flesh with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. None of it must be kept beyond the next morning. Whatever is left over shall be burned up. You couldn't waste it. You couldn't throw it out to the dogs. Whatever you didn't eat, you had to burn in fire. Nothing was wasted. Exodus 12 says, This day shall be a memorial feast for you, which all your generations shall celebrate with pilgrimage to the Lord as a perpetual institution. Look at this sentence closely. Circle all your generations. And circle perpetual institution. All your generations. Does that include us? Yeah, sure it does. All your generations shall celebrate as a perpetual institution. It never stops. It never ends. For seven days you must eat unleavened bread. From the very first day you shall have your house clean of all leaven. Whoever eats unleavened bread from the first day to the seventh day shall be cut off from Israel. They are to keep this custom of unleavened bread. And since it was on this very day... I brought, the, brought you from the ranks of Egypt. You must celebrate it as a perpetual institution. Then to take a bunch of hyssop. Exodus 12 says that to take a bunch of hyssop and dip in it in the blood that's in the basin, sprinkle the lentil and the doorpost with this blood. None of you shall go out until morning. For the Lord will go by striking down the Egyptians. Seeing the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over that door, and not let the destroyer come into your house to strike you down. You shall observe this as a perpetual ordinance for yourselves and for your descendants. As a perpetual ordinance for yourselves and for your descendants. Now, I was wondering if they're to take a bunch of hyssop. I didn't know what hyssop was, so I googled it. I found out that a hyssop was a type of plant that grew in Egypt some 4,000 years ago. It still grows today. I saw a few pictures of it. I'm sure it's changed a little bit because plants have a way of evolving through time. But the point is they couldn't just take their hand or a cloth and rub the blood on the doorpost. They had to use a hyssop branch. The instructions were specific. And then in Exodus 12, 46, it says, It must be eaten one and in the same house. You may not take any of its flesh outside, and you shall not break any of its bones. This is in reference to the lamb. Circle, you shall not break any of its bones. If these specific instructions were followed, the angel of death would pass over your family and your firstborn would be spared. Now, if you think about it, God could have given them a lot of ways as a ritual for this angel of death to pass over, but this is what he chose for them to do. So the Israelites follow the instructions. They kill the lamb. They don't break the bone. They take the blood. They put it on the doorpost. They go inside, they eat the roasted flesh, the bitter herbs, and they wait. And that night, the angel of death passes over. The firstborn of Egypt is dead. The firstborn of Israel is spared. And Pharaoh says, your God is too strong. Leave Egypt. And they leave Egypt. They go out into the desert. And in Exodus 12, 37, it says, the Israelites set out for Ramses, about 600,000 men on foot not counting children, about a million people, scholars estimate about a million people, walked out of Egypt. They walked out. Now imagine a city the size of Detroit has about a million people. If they all went out on the interstate and started walking out, what a sight that would be. It would probably cover both lanes and go out for miles. But they walked out of Egypt and they walked out into the desert. Now, there are a lot of better ways to, to escape Egypt, but the Lord guided them to leave crossing the desert. While they're out in the desert, they're thirsty. 
And miraculously, God provides water for them to drink. But they're hungry. And they go to Moses and they ask Moses, did you bring us out in this desert to starve? Moses prays to God. And God answers in Exodus 16. He answers and says, the Lord said to Moses, I will now rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people are to go out and gather their daily portion. Thus I will test them to see whether they follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, however, when they prepare what they bring in, let it be twice as much as they gather on the other days. Now I'd like you to take your pen or pencil and circle, rain down bread from heaven for you. And underline from heaven, not just bread that falls from the sky, it falls from heaven. And also circle daily portion. I'm sure you're familiar with the Lord's Prayer. What about that part that says, give us this day our daily bread? That ought to sound a little familiar to you right here. So Moses told him, let no one keep it over till tomorrow morning. Each day they were to eat what they picked up. They were to consume it or burn it in fire. Nothing was wasted. Except on the day before the Sabbath day, they would gather a, a double portion, a two-day portion, and they would hold it over because it wouldn't fall on the Sabbath day. And it wouldn't turn wormy and rotten. If they held it over any other day besides the Sabbath, it would turn wormy and rotten. So they had to follow his instructions. The Israelites call this food manna. The Bible tells us in Exodus 16, it was like a coriander seed, but white, and it tasted like a wafer made with honey. The Israelites ate this manna for 40 years until they came to settle land. They ate the manna until they reached the borders of Canaan. Now, did God have a poor menu selection? Or did he choose to feed a million people bread from heaven for a reason? This is a prefiguration of Jesus giving us the bread of life. Of course he fed it for a reason. I was wondering, you know, the Israelites wandered for 40 years eating, eating manna. How long can a person live just eating bread? So I Googled it. And actually they had a website that showed that somebody could live about six or seven months if they only ate bread. I hope they never tested this on someone. But if you, if you just ate bread, it doesn't give you enough to survive on. There's not enough amino acids and vitamins and proteins. Our bodies are very specific. I read the book of Exodus pretty thoroughly, and I haven't found where anyone suffered malnutrition. So apparently the manna was life-sustaining. It was a mystery. They didn't know what it was. In fact, in Hebrew, the word manna means, what is it? That's what it means. What is it? What is it? It fell from the sky. It fell from heaven every day. We ate it, and it provided nourishment for us. So God feeds a million people for 40 years. This is a huge miracle. While they're in the desert, they're given the Ten Commandments. They make a covenant with God. And He instructs them how to make vestments while sacrificing. Exodus 28 tells us, These are the vestments they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a brocaded tunic, a miter and sash. In making these sacred vestments, which your brother Aaron and his sons are to wear, in serving as my priest, they shall use gold, violet, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. A tunic of fine linen shall be brocaded. The mitre shall be made of fine linen. Aaron and his sons are to wear them whenever they go into the meeting tent or approach the altar to minister in the sanctuary, lest they incur guilt and die. This shall be a perpetual ordinance for him and for his descendants. Do we still see special vestments used in the church today? Of course we do. Notice what the priest wears. They do put on special tunics. They do wear special clothing. We'll see that much of the tradition that the Catholic Church has actually comes from ancient Judaism. Now I'll mention to you in our handout that you have that um, this is taken from the, from the Bible where I went online and compressed uh, Bible verses. I got this information from the New American Bible. This is the Bible that the Catholic Church reads out of every Sunday all across America. I don't know if everybody realizes this, but the, the Catholic Church reads, the readings from the Catholic Church are the same at every church every day throughout the country. 
actually throughout the world. But the United States uses the New American Bible. So I copied and pasted out of the New American Bible the entire handout, except for the part on the Passover meal. Now, if you're following on the handout, you should come to a part that explains the Jewish Passover meal. The feast of the Passover is instituted and practiced for nearly 1,300 years. During the Passover meal, or, or so-called the Seder meal, there's an obligation to drink four cups of wine. Each of these cups of wine represents a promise that God made to Moses and to the Israelites. Exodus 6 says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians, it's the first cup, and will deliver you from their slavery, the second cup. I will rescue you by my outstretched arms and with mighty acts of judgment, the third cup. I will take you as my own people, and you shall have me as your God. You will know that I, the Lord, am your God when I free you from the labor of the Egyptians. That's the fourth cup. Now, to really understand the Eucharist, we have to realize it was instituted in the upper room by Christ. What was Jesus doing in the upper room? He was there to celebrate a Passover meal. We need to have a little lesson in a Passover meal to understand what Christ was doing because he's going to disrupt this Passover meal and change things. Now, Bible scholars know this. And it's really not debated heavily, but we don't really know this information, so we have to do a little bit of background on it. To begin with, uh, if, you've been, if you've participated in a, in a Seder meal or a Passover meal, that information would help you. So if you get an opportunity to, I encourage you to, to actually visit a, a Passover meal. They still go on today uh, pretty much in the Jewish community like they did many years ago. From the very first part of the Passover meal, you have the festival blessing where the priest says some prayers and begins with, with the blessing of the Passover meal and they all drink the first cup of wine. After they drink the first cup of, of wine, they proceed to the Passover narrative. And at this point, the youngest child in the room asks the oldest or the presiding priest and says, Grandpa, Grandpa, Tell us how the slaves were saved in Egypt. And they would read from the Torah. They would read the Exodus from the Torah and read exactly how the slaves were freed so that they would never forget the story and could pass it on. And after they would read the narrative story, they would sing Psalm 113, which is called the Little Hallel. Hallel means praise. It's a praise psalm. And after they would sing the Little Hallel, they would all drink from the second cup of wine. After they drank from the second cup of wine, they would proceed over to the main course of the meal. This is the third part of the meal, where they ate the special foods that, that were instructed in the Bible. They ate the roasted lamb, which represented that lamb that they roasted that night that the angel of death passed over with the unbroken bones. And then they would eat bitter herbs. And these bitter herbs reminded them of the bitterness of bondage and when they were enslaved. They also ate green herbs. And the green herbs were dipped into salt water. And the salt water reminded them of the tears that they shed while they were enslaved in Egypt. They ate something called a horosis, which is apple. And it's cooked in wine. It's cooked with a little cinnamon and nutmeg. Uh, it actually tastes pretty good. Um, this reminded them of the mortar that was used in the bricks to build Egypt. And they ate the matzah, the unleavened bread. Just like on the original night of the Passover, they were instructed to, to uh, eat unleavened bread. They didn't have time for the bread to rise. They were going to leave in, in a hurry. There was no time. It takes time for bread to rise. So they had to eat the bread unleavened. And in this Passover meal, they still practice eating unleavened bread. After they finished the meal, they would drink from the third cup of wine. This third cup of wine is referred to as the cup of blessing. That ought to sound familiar to you if you're Catholic. Oftentimes we'll sing the cup of blessing which we bless. It's referring to the third cup of the Passover. This is going to be the cup that Jesus interrupts later on in the upper room when he institutes the Eucharist. After they drank the third cup of wine, 
the Passover is completed when they sing the great Hallel, which is Psalm 114 through 118. And they drink the fourth cup of wine after they sing the Psalms. And the presiding priest or the host says the phrase, tell to lest I, or it is consummated or translated also as it is finished. Keep in mind, there are four parts of a Passover meal. We're going to see this again when Jesus goes into the upper room. Now, the Jews celebrate this feast for 1,300 years. And in a second, we're going to be fast-forwarding through the Bible. We've been in the Old Testament. We've been actually studying in Exodus uh, for the most part. But before we do, I want to, I want to quote a, a, a prophecy, a prediction of the Messiah. And it comes from uh, Jeremiah 31, 31. And it goes like this. It's very important. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand and led them forth from the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, and I had to show myself their master, says the Lord. But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Look back at that in circle. I will make a new covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers. But this is a covenant which I shall make. It's a new covenant. This is a prediction of a new covenant coming. So those predictions of the Messiah, and he's born. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Now, we all know that. But did you know that the name Bethlehem means house of bread? House of bread. You ought to jot that down right there. Bethlehem is, a, Bethlehem is a small town that formed outside of Jerusalem. If you remember, there's a lot of animal sacrifice taking place in the Old Testament. Actually, uh, a million people left Egypt, and they had a lot of need for animal sacrifice. They needed a lot of lambs. Just with Passover, they needed thousands of male unblemished lambs. And if every other one born is male and one's female, you needed quite a bit of animals. There were so many animals that were necessary for a sacrifice that there were tens of thousands of animals outside of Jerusalem being raised for sacrifice. The shepherds that actually raised these animals for sacrifice formed a town. That town's outside of Jerusalem called Bethlehem. These are the very shepherds who were guarding the sacrificial lambs of the Old Testament that the angel Gabriel appeared to that night Jesus was born and gave them a personal invitation to come to the seeing when Jesus is born, and to witness the Lamb of God and the Good Shepherd, to come in and personally witness. These shepherds were special. They were guarding the lambs of the Old Covenant. Now Jesus grows. He matures. And when he's around 30 years old, he enters into his ministry. He teaches and he performs many miracles. One of the most remembered miracles is the feeding of the 5,000. And I say it's the most remembered miracle because it's the only miracle that Jesus performed that is recorded in all four Gospels. I'm going to say that again. This is the only miracle that Jesus performed that's written down in all four Gospels. If you'll follow along, Jesus is teaching on a mountain. He's in the desert. And the people are hungry. Does that sound familiar? Just like the Israelites who were in the desert, they were hungry. God fed them. But this time Jesus is, is teaching. It's been a long day. And the people are hungry. And Jesus says to the disciples, there's no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. Matthew records, but they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over, 12 wicker baskets. We've probably heard this story a hundred times in our life, but today I want to look at it 
in a new way. Take your pen or pencil and circle the words taking, blessing, broke, and gave. We're going to see this pattern of handling the bread ten times before this presentation ends. Matthew records that Jesus took, blessed, broke, and gave. And also he records that he picked up the fragments left over. They didn't just leave the food on the ground when they were done. They picked up the fragments left over. And how many baskets were there left over? Twelve. There were twelve baskets left over. Symbolic of one for each tribe of Israel. Now what I've done is compressed all the Gospels so that you don't have to flip through the Bible. Look at Mark. Then taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up 12 worker baskets full of fragments and what was left of the fish. Now notice that Mark records that Jesus handled the bread the same way. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. And that nothing was left over, they picked up the fragments, and that there was 12 baskets left over. What about Luke? How does Luke record this? Then taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking to heaven, he said the blessing over them, broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. They all ate and were satisfied. And when the leftover fragments were picked up, they filled 12 worker baskets. He recorded the same way. Jesus took, blessed, and broke, and gave. He handled the bread in a special way. He didn't just grab the bread and give it out. He handled the bread in a very special way. They all noticed it. They wrote it down the same way. Look at John. The Gospel of John was written many years after the Synoptic Gospels, many years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So perhaps the author had a chance to look at the other Gospels and figure, what do they not have here? He begins with saying, the Jewish feast of the Passover was near. Now, they thought it was important to include that he did this miracle at Passover time. Now, Jesus dies at Passover, not this Passover. This is a year, maybe two, we don't know. This is a year, around Passover time, Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Thought it was important to include that. He, he says, <clears throat> Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had their fill, he said to the disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. It's also recorded in John that Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed which is broken gave, and also they picked up the fragments left over. That's the, that's the, uh, the miracle of feeding 5,000. Many people don't realize there's also another bread miracle in the Bible. It's only recorded in two Gospels, only in Matthew and Mark. But Jesus feeds in a very similar fashion. He feeds 4,000 people. But there are some differences, and it's very important. I want to show you. In Matthew 15, Jesus feeds 4,000 people, and he's also teaching again, and they're hungry. I guess the disciples probably knew what he was going to do this time. But he says to them, how many loaves do you have? This time they have seven. And they replied, a few fish. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish. He gave thanks and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets full. Now this time they started with seven. The first time they started with five loaves. Now they start with seven loaves. The first time they fed 5,000, this time they're feeding 4,000. But notice he handled the bread the same way. He took, he blessed, which is gave thanks. He broke and gave. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. He handled the bread the same way he did when he fed 5,000 people. They picked up the fragments left over. This time, seven baskets full. Look at Mark. Mark also records the feeding of the 4,000. He ordered the crowds to sit down, and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to the disciples, and they, and they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said the blessing over them, and ordered them distributed also. They ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets. Mark also records, he took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. You should be circling these. Jesus handled the bread in a very special way. 
The seven baskets left over are symbolic, one for every day of the week. And seven is one of these special numbers in the Bible. It means fulfillment. There's enough bread left over for the entire world. Now, do you think that Jesus had a poor menu selection? I asked you that same question about God when he fed the, the million Israelites in the desert. But do you think Jesus had a poor menu selection? I mean, he could have fed them. He could have fed them a lot of things. Could have fed them meat, vegetables, fruits. Or do you think Jesus chose to feed 5,000 and 4,000 people bread? Sure, he did it on purpose. It's for a reason. This is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist, the perpetual gift that Jesus will leave for his church. He also fed fish. Just like in the desert, they were given quail to eat so they could have a little flesh. The fish was also given, but the focus is on the bread. The focus is on the bread. The next section we're going to be studying, if you're following along in the handout, is called the Bread of Life Discourse. Now, Jesus is feeding people. Imagine he's got a lot of friends. I mean, times are tough. He's giving out free food, good teachings, a few miracles, and lots of food. He's probably got a lot of friends. And he talks to them, and, and while he's speaking to them, he answers them and says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. He's calling them a bunch of freeloaders, kind of saying, y'all just follow me because you're getting some free food. And then he tells them, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. I'd like you to circle food that endures for eternal life. And also, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus is going to give them the food that endures for eternal life. When does he give it? He's going to show it to them at the Last Supper in the Eucharist. But right now he's talking to them and, and uh, they ask him in John 6, so they said to him, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They want to see a miracle. What sign can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert. Now, many times I didn't connect the feeding of the 5,000 with God feeding a, a million Israelite slaves bread from heaven. But they get it. They're in conversation with Jesus, and they tell him that our ancestors ate manna in the desert. You did a bread miracle. God did a bread miracle. Moses did a bread miracle with God. And they see the, co the connection here. And Jesus says to them, Amen, amen, I say to you. Now, when Jesus starts off a sentence and says, Amen, amen, it might sound a little funny to us because we use amen to end a prayer. But amen, amen is also translated truly, truly, or verily, verily, depending on what translation your Bible has. Amen, amen is saying, I promise what I'm saying is true. I swear this to you. It's not cursing, but saying, I promise this is important and true. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My Father gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. In that passage, I'd like you to circle, comes down from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Circle, I am the bread of life. What bread of life comes down from heaven? Do you remember the manna? God had the manna fall from heaven every day. Now the Jews murmured about this because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Joseph? Do we not know his father and his mother? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Now they get it. Jesus is comparing himself to the manna that fell from the sky, from heaven, that fed the Israelites. And he's saying, I am the bread of life. And they're looking at him and saying, hey, we know who your mama is. We know who your daddy is. How can you say you came down from heaven? 
And Jesus says to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. You see the bread? The bread that I will give is my, fr is my flesh for the life of the world. The bread that endures for eternal life. Circle that last sentence, the whole sentence. It begins, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Circle that entire sentence. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Circle, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Now, they knew he was talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Now, when Jesus was, was speaking and, and giving this information, it was written down. It was written down in the Greek language. The author of the book of John wrote this down, and he used the word trogo. Now, the word trogo means to eat. But if we're going to use the English language to express ourselves in ways that we eat, we could say we, we ate, we nibbled, we munched, chowed down, hogged down, whatever you want to try. But there are different ways to express it. In the Greek language, there's about 18 words that John could have chosen to record the, what Jesus said, you must eat my flesh. He used the word trogo because the word trogo cannot be taken symbolically. It means to rip or to tear or to gnaw on. He used the word trogo. Now the disciples said, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? Well, you wonder, why are they, when Jesus tells them he must, he must drink his blood and eat his flesh, well, yeah, that bothered them. Sure, it bothered them. My mama taught me not to drink blood of an animal or of a person. I mean, I was raised the same way. Well, where did they get this teaching from? I looked through the Bible and I found a special place in Leviticus 17 where they talk about drinking blood and to stay away from it. And Moses taught this to the people. Let's read Leviticus. If anyone, whether of the house of Israel or aliens residing among them, partakes of any blood, I will set myself against that one who partakes of blood and I will cut him off from among his people. Since the life of a living body is in its blood, I have made you put it on the altar so that atonement may be there may thereby be made for your own lives because it is the blood as the seed of life that makes atonement. That is why I've told the Israelites, no one among you, not even a resident alien, may partake of blood. Blood was special. The life of a living body is in its blood. If you drink blood from an animal, you commingle the life of that animal with yours. That's not good. God told Moses to tell people not to do that. And it's the blood as a seed of life that makes atonement. They sprinkle on the altar for the forgiveness of sins. Now, but this is Jesus talking to them. And Jesus is saying, drink my blood, eat my flesh. Just like if it's the blood of an animal, it's bad to commingle yourself, but to commingle yourself with God's blood and body is awesome. He's saying, drink my blood and eat my body. But they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who Jesus was. He hadn't died yet. He hasn't been resurrected yet. They didn't know who he was. He was a teacher. So in John 6, 61, it records this. Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? They don't believe who he is. They don't believe he came from heaven. He says, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? 
What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? What if you see me go back? You don't believe I came down from heaven? What if you see me ascend back up to heaven? And does he? Yes, after the resurrection, they meet in Bethany with the disciples, and they witness him going back up into heaven into a cloud. Many people saw this. I imagine this group of people believed who he was then and participated right afterwards. Jesus also says, It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the one who would betray him. Now notice how Judas is included with the ones who did not believe. He didn't believe that Jesus could give his flesh for the life of the world. He also says, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. Now these disciples were not the original twelve that walked away, but there were people who had given up their lives and their families and were following Jesus and witnessing the miracles He performed. And when He gave the bread of life information to them to eat His flesh and drink His blood, they didn't know who He was. They didn't know that God Himself was teaching them. And He is a greater authority than Moses. And He can change the law. So they walked off. They left. They didn't recognize Him. And I'm sure after the ascension they did recognize Him. Soon the Passover approaches and Jesus goes into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Remember this is a perpetual ordinance that to do this every year? Well, Jesus' famous ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey happens on the 10th of the month, the 10th of the month of Nisan. Remember the lamb is to be slaughtered on the 14th day of the month? But on the 10th of the month that to bring the lambs in for inspection, and they look at them until the 14th, then they slaughter the lambs. On the 10th of the month, Jesus rides into Jerusalem for inspection. Then he's declared unblemished by none other than Pontius Pilate. After he cleanses the temple, he explains his death and his glorification. Many times when Jesus is teaching and talking, he explains, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. Once with Mary, he's saying, my hour has not yet come. Why does this concern me in the wedding feast of Canaan? This time it's noted this is the coming of Jesus' hour. His death and glorification. Jesus says in John 12, Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now Jesus chooses his words carefully here. He could have said, unless an apricot falls to the ground and dies, it remains just an apricot. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. What would be the fruit of an apricot? It would be more apricots. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. And what is the fruit of wheat? It's bread. It's bread. Many times Jesus uses a seed to explain the kingdom of God. Many times in the Gospels it's written down. And this time he explains his glorification, which is the reason he came down from heaven. Up from heaven he came down to earth was to die for us. His glorification was to come down here and die for us, to bring redemption to mankind. Now Jesus and His disciples were Jewish, so they celebrated the Feast of the Passover every year. Luke records, when the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread arrived, the day for sacrifice in the Passover lamb, He sent out Peter and John, instructing them, 
Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Go and make preparations. Well, let's see. They had to procure a lamb. They had to kill a lamb without breaking his bones. They had to make unleavened bread. They had to gather together the bitter herbs and the salt water and the green herbs. There were a lot of symbolic foods that they had to put together, and there's more. So he tells them to make the preparations, and he answered them. <clears throat> they asked him, where do you want us to make the preparations? And he answered them, when you go into the city, a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room that is furnished. Make the preparations there. Then they went off and found everything exactly as he told them. And there they prepared the Passover. Go into the city. A man will meet you carrying a jar of water. I've been told that carrying water was a woman's job. And to find a man carrying water would be a little bit odd. And they did. They found everything as Jesus had told them. And they prepared the symbolic foods of the Passover, ready to celebrate this Passover meal, as they all have every year of their life. This begins as a normal Passover meal. Now, the, the disciples of Jesus were Jewish. And when, they, when the Gospels were written, they were written for people who knew about a Passover meal. And we're Gentiles that live 2,000 years later, and we don't really understand anything about a Passover meal. So when we read this section, a lot of it just goes right over my head. We're going to look at this. Now that we've had our background on the Passover, we're going to look at this with new eyes. Look at Matthew's recording. While they were eating. No, stop. Time out right there. While they were eating. Now we know from our order of the Passover, which we studied, that they already had the first cup, which was a festival blessing. They've already had the, the Passover narrative, which is where they explain how the Israelites were, were freed from bondage. They haven't drank from the third cup yet because you do that after you eat. So they're right in the Passover in the middle of it, the part where they're eating. They're eating the symbolic foods. And Jesus says to them, Jesus took the bread, he said the blessing, broke it, and giving it to his disciples, said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, he gave thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed on behalf of many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you from now on, I shall not drink this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it with you new in the kingdom of my Father. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now there's something wrong here. This is not a normal process for a Passover meal. They're supposed to eat the symbolic foods and drink the third cup and close the Passover meal by drinking the fourth cup. But Jesus changes things. He takes the bread and he holds it the same way, he handles it the same way he did when he fed 5,000 people. And when he fed 4,000 people, he took the bread, said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to him and said, this is my body I was telling you about. This is my body. Take it and eat it. Then he took a cup. Now what cup was it? Oh, wait, the third cup. Jesus takes a cup, the third cup, the cup of blessing. He takes the third cup and says, drink this. This is the blood. This is my blood of the covenant. It's a new covenant. Had an old covenant. He institutes a new covenant. And they do. And this covenant will be, um, will be shed. The blood is shed on behalf of, of many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood in the old covenant was put on the altar for atonement for sins. Now, Jesus does something here that's totally off the wall, and we miss this a lot. We miss this totally. He's supposed to close the Passover meal, but he doesn't. It's almost as if he intends to just leave it open. He looks and says, I tell you, from now on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new in the kingdom of, of my Father. We're supposed to be reading Jesus drank from the fourth cup, but he didn't. He puts the fourth cup down, and they, they sing a hymn, which is the great Hallel, and they walk out of the Passover meal. Jesus walked out in the middle of his Passover meal. He did it for a reason. He purposely omits drinking from this fourth cup. He's going to drink the fourth cup in a little while. It's going to be hard. He's going to die drinking that fourth cup. Right now, the Passover meal is open. He hasn't closed the Passover meal. 
Now let's look at what Mark records. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, he gave thanks, and gave it to them, and, said, and they all drank from it. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now Mark records, while they were eating in the third part of the meal, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke it. He also records Jesus handled the bread the same way he did when he fed 5,000 and he fed 4,000. And he said, take it. This is my body. He took a cup. He gave thanks. He gave it to all of them and said, drink from it. This is my blood of the covenant. Circle, this is my body. And circle, this is my blood. Mark also records that Jesus does not drink from the fourth cup. It says, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, he went out to the Mount of Olives. Look at Luke. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from this time on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. Circle new covenant. It's very important. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. It will be shed. It will be shed on the cross. They all record that they sing a hymn, which is the great Hallel, and they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now they go to a garden because the redemption of mankind begins in a garden because the fall of mankind started in a garden. Adam and Eve were in a garden, and Jesus brings redemption beginning in the garden of Gethsemane. While he's in the garden, he prays. Matthew records, Then Jesus came to the place with him, the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and, and began to feel sorrow and distress. He said to them, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. What cup? What cup is Jesus praying? Let this cup, if it is your will. What cup? It's the fourth cup. He has another cup to drink. He knows it's going to be hard drinking this cup. He knows the future. But he prays, let it be your will, Father, not my will. Matthew also records, withdrawing a second time, he prayed, My Father, if it is not possible that this cup pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Then he returned once and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open. He left them and withdrew again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Mark records, Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. Circle take this cup away from me. We're going to see Jesus drink this cup in a little while. He's going to close the Passover meal. This meal is still open. Luke records, After withdrawing a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. This Passover meal is still open. Jesus has another cup to drink. He hasn't closed the Passover meal. He's going to close it in a little while, but first he's going to change the sacrificial lamb. They used to sacrifice a lamb during Passover. Jesus will be sacrificed. We have a new lamb, the Lamb of God. The Passover meal is open. It would be like 
if during Mass, after we've had communion, before the priest gives us our final blessing, he tells everyone in church, Mass is not over. We're all going to proceed. Before I give the final blessing, we're going to proceed over to the uh, community hall and we're going to bless the St. Joseph altar that is there today. So everyone, let's proceed over to the new community hall. And everyone walks over, leaves the church and goes to the hall. While they're walking, is Mass still going on? Yes, it's not over until the final blessing is given. And after the priest were to bless the St. Joseph altar, he gives the final blessing, Mass ends. This Passover meal is continued at this point. It's not over with yet. It will close later on. I'll show you when it closes. So Jesus is in the garden, and Jesus is arrested. Look at, the, at your hand out at the top of it. It says, Jesus is arrested. I think it ought to say, Jesus allows himself to be arrested. All through the Gospels, they tried to arrest Jesus, and he would just walk right through the people, right through their midst. They couldn't catch him. He's God. He could get away anytime he wanted to. But John records a special way Jesus was arrested. It goes like this. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, whom are you looking for? Now notice he doesn't run. They're coming to arrest him. He knows that. He goes and meets him and says, whom are you looking for? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. And when he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So again he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And Jesus said, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he said. I had not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave. He cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup the Father gave me? Look at the cup again. Shall I not drink the cup? He's saying, Peter, you can't win this fight. Not tonight. I could get away if I wanted to. I'm letting myself be arrested. But notice who's in charge. I've seen a lot of police movies on TV and sometimes people get arrested on these shows and they, they chase them in a car and a car wrecks and they run and they hold them down and they, they uh, handcuff them. There's a lot of screaming and yelling and kicking. But Jesus lets himself be arrested. In fact, he's completely in charge. He walks out and says, who are you looking for? They tell him and he says, I am. They fall to the ground. He doesn't run. He stays right there. He's completely in charge. Peter pulls his sword out and says, he cut, cut his ear off and, and Jesus says, not tonight. Don't fight. I have a cup to drink. He knows what's coming. So after they arrest him, they have a few mock trials. And eventually Jesus is condemned to death. When he was condemned to death, it was preparation day for Passover, John 19. And he says it was about noon when Jesus is condemned to death. Now actually in, in ancient Egypt, when they would uh, procure the lambs, when they were declared unblemished for slaughter, it was noon when the high priest would do this. And Jesus is condemned to death at noon. And Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. But Jesus was also declared unblemished. He needed to be, just like the lambs were. But he's declared unblemished by none other than Pontius Pilate himself, who says in Luke 23, I find this man not guilty. And also later in Luke 23, he says, I have not found this man guilty of the charges that you have brought against him, nor did Herod, for he sent him back to us. So no capital crime has been committed by him. Several times, Pilate exclaims that Jesus is not guilty. Jesus is eventually condemned to death. 
and he's forced to carry his cross. He's beaten unrecognizably. They lay the cross on his shoulders, and he carries his cross up the hill of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine drugged with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. They recorded that Jesus did not drink the wine. He was offered wine. He didn't take it. He was beaten unmercifully. He was probably very thirsty. He did not take the wine. It's very important. Now, in the book of John, John records in John 19, 23, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless and woven into one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. Look at the verse that says they also took his tunic. John describes what kind of clothes Jesus is wearing. Remember in, in the early Exodus when God gave an explanation of what type of clothes they would wear when sacrificing? The priests were to wear certain vestments. Jesus was wearing a tunic. The tunic was seamless. He's wearing the clothes of the high priest. Circle tunic. Jesus is wearing the clothes that the priest wore when sacrificing. He's not only the lamb of this sacrifice, he's the presiding priest over the sacrifice. It also says in order that a passage of scripture might be fulfilled. We're going to see that in the next three passages. This didn't happen by accident. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled. This was prophesied. It was a prophecy. This would actually happen. In John 19, 28, it's recorded, after this, aware that everything is now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Well, there's a lot going on in this passage. Look back at it. In order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Now, he's probably been thirsty for a long time. He turned down the wine earlier. Now he's asking, and there's wine nearby. I thirst. They bring him the wine. They put the wine on a sponge, on a sprig of hyssop. Circle the hyssop again. Circle wine. He tastes the wine. It's recorded. Jesus had taken the wine. He closed the Passover meal. And then he says the words to close the Passover meal with. It is finished. Tell to lest I. It is consummated. The Passover meal is finished. But not just over this time. Fulfilled. Completed. The old covenant's done. The new covenant's begun. While they're noticing Jesus on the cross... He's dying with, with two soldiers. They didn't want him to hang because the Sabbath day was coming. You couldn't have a person on a cross dying on the, Sabbath, on the Sabbath day. So they would expedite the death of the people on the cross by breaking the legs of the person on the cross so they would collapse and fall and then their lungs would fill with body fluids and they would actually drown in their own body fluids. And John records, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then the other of the one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Circle that. They did not break his legs. Why is it important that John noticed that they didn't break any, his legs? Remember the lamb in Egypt? You couldn't break the bones of the lamb. You didn't have a worthy sacrifice. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately the blood and the water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you may also come to believe. 
For this happened so that a scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. It's recorded in John they did not break his bones. And it was important. What time did Jesus die on the cross? Luke 23 says it was about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. In Mark it says, at three o'clock, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shamaktana, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, what time is it? Mark records at three o'clock, Jesus cries out. Three o'clock, that's twilight. That's the time that they were ordered to sacrifice the lambs, to slaughter the lambs with the whole assembly of Israel present. Sound familiar? Not a coincidence. I mentioned that Jesus was the presiding priest over the sacrifice as well as the Lamb of God in this sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. How do we know that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb? Well, he's identified by John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? He was Jesus' cousin. And he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. And early in the book of John, it's recorded that when Jesus walked up, John 1.29 says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And also, the next day John was there again with his two disciples and watched Jesus walk by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist is making straight the path of the Lord. One way is by identifying him to us and telling us that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's also recorded in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. It says that uh, we were ransomed from your futile conduct, handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a spotless, unblemished lamb. There are a few prophecies that Jesus would be uh, this lamb. And in Isaiah, a couple of times it's mentioned, it says, Like a lamb led to, to slaughter, or a sheep before the shears, he was silent and opened not his mouth. And also in Isaiah 53, 12, it says, And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. Peter states that he, we were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ as a spotless, unblemished lamb. And I think that's very important that we know that. Matthew 27, 46 records, About three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shemektana, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This particular cry of Jesus has always bothered me. Why would he cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I heard many explanations of this none of which I was satisfied with. But I heard the explanation of someone who had gone over to the Holy Land, studied ancient Judaism, studied their customs and their ways. And in their study, they found out that the Jews were taught many psalms coming up as a child. And I thought to myself, you know, I was taught a few. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I was taught a few psalms, but we have them written down. We can read them when we want to. But back then... It was very important to, to know that the, the Jews learned from memory and recited many of the Psalms. And the way you would say they didn't have a, this particular Psalm is going to be Psalm 22, if you want to look in the Bible, but they didn't have them numbered. So what they would do to direct someone to the Psalm they would, would pray, they would say the first line of the Psalm. And the first line in the Psalm of Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, the word abandon and the word forsaken are derived from the same origin. So it's the same thing. They would say, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? People would say the psalm along with them. And I read Psalm 22. I'm not going to go over it with you right now, but you should study Psalm 22. Look at it. It's important. The psalm begins in a cry of desolation. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? My God, I call by day, but you do not answer by night, but I have no relief. And it goes into a description of the crucifixion and, and says that uh, Jesus' throat, his throat is, is dry and many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me, so wasted on my hands and my feet that I can count on my bones. 
They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. It gives a very good description of the prophesied crucifixion. And then it ends with the Messiah bringing salvation to generations not yet born to the ends of the world. It's a prophecy that was fulfilled. And when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The Jews that were listening looked up and said, oh, the prophecy has been fulfilled. I'd like to explain this in a little better way. Um, I'm going to steal something that, that uh, Dr. Scott Hahn gives a gr great example of this, and I couldn't think of a better way to explain this, so I'm going to steal his example if I can. Let's imagine that a group of anti-American terrorists came into this room that I'm in, and I was a, a famous patriot, and they came to me, and they beat me up, and they sat me down in a corner, and they wanted me to to renounce my patriotism and to speak badly of the American government, and I wouldn't do it. And they finally came to me and said, if you don't do this, we're going to kill you. And they hold a gun on me, and they tell me they're going to put a live camera on me, a television camera. And the camera zooms in on me, they turn the camera on, and they look at me and say, do you have any last words? And I say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. Do I need to finish the words to the pledge? No. Everybody in America who's listening knows the words to the pledge. It's something very common. They know what my patriotism is. They know what I just said. I don't need to finish the pledge. Jesus doesn't need to finish the psalm. When he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? They responded, oh, it's been fulfilled. The prophecy. They knew it. You may also want to study Psalm 31. The second verse says, Into your hands I commend my spirit. The prophecy is also fulfilled. Now when Jesus died, special things happened. In Matthew 27, it's recorded, And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked. Rocks were split. Tombs were opened. And the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Wow, what a death. Look what all happened. The curtain in the temple that divided the holy from the holy of holies was torn in two from the top to bottom. Now, if two men were going to tear that curtain, they would grab it at the bottom and tear it from the bottom up. This was torn by an angel. It doesn't say. But it was torn from top to bottom. Rocks were split. The earth quaked. We know from another gospel that there was also an eclipse. And also, the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Dead people got out of their graves. And after the resurrection, they walked into the city and appeared to many people. This was no ordinary death. When Jesus died, a lot happened. Everyone knew it. Even the centurion looks up and says, certainly this was the Son of God. Jesus is taken down off the cross. He's buried. And three days later, he conquers death and is resurrected. And he appears to many people. One of the most famous appearances is on that Easter Sunday morning on the road to Emmaus. It's in Luke. Luke 24. If you recall the story, two disciples are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now Emmaus is a town about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And they leave Jerusalem and they're walking. They've got a seven mile walk. And they're talking, of course, of what all had happened. And this stranger, who's really Jesus, walks in with them, but they don't recognize him. Their eyes were shielded. They don't know who he is. And Jesus kind of walks in and starts talking to them. And and ask them really what's going on. And they say, well, don't you know what everyone's talking about? This man named Jesus. And they explained to him what had happened over the last several days, all the miracles that he had done. They said he was a prophet. They thought he was a prophet. And how he had come to Jerusalem and was crucified and had died. And they were hoping that he would be the one who had redeemed Israel. And Jesus began to speak to them. And he opened up the scriptures to them. And it's recorded in Luke 24. 
Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And they walked on to Emmaus, and he taught the whole way there. After they got to Emmaus, to where they were going, the two apostles go into the room, and Jesus kind of directed that he was going to go a little further down the road. And they said, come, stay with us. Stay with us. They liked listening to him. So Jesus did. And Luke 24 says, And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. And with that, their eyes were open, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning while he spoke to us on the way and he opened the scripture to us? Then they recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. They ran back to Jerusalem and talked to the other disciples. And they thought it was important that Jesus had made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, while he was handling the bread, the same way he did when he fed 5,000, when he fed 4,000, and only three nights earlier in the upper room, they noticed he handled the bread the same way. And then their eyes were open, and he vanished. Now, was he playing tricks? What was he doing? He left them with the Eucharist, the first Eucharist. They ran all the way back to Jerusalem to explain to disciples how Jesus showed himself to them in the breaking of the bread. I mentioned to you earlier that the Passover was fulfilled and the new covenant of the Eucharist is instituted and it's new and it's everlasting. The feast goes on forever. This is ordered by God. It's a perpetual ordinance. In the book of Acts, we see bits and pieces of the early church coming together. It's recorded in Acts, Acts 2 verse 42. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wondrous signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to the meeting together in the temple area and to the breaking of the bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all people. And every day the Lord added to the number of those being saved. Now look back at this passage. It said they, they met together in the temple area daily. And then the, the break, they broke the bread in their homes daily. Now many of the Jews did not accept Jesus at this time as the Messiah and the Son of God. Therefore, they still celebrate the Passover. They're still in the Passover. Many of them are still in the Passover today, still celebrating the Passover. All of the people that became Christians and accept Jesus as the Messiah and Savior gave up the old Passover and celebrate the new feast of the Eucharist. And we see it right here. Paul carries the word of, of Jesus and salvation to many different areas in the, on the earth. And he goes to Corinth. He teaches them. And then later he writes letters that we can read in the Bible called the letters to the Corinthians. And in the first letter that he sent to the Corinthians, he told them in 1 Corinthians 5, clear out the old yeast so that you may, you may become a fresh batch of dough. And as much as you are in leaven, for our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Go back and circle for our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. And celebrate the feast. The first feast in the Old Covenant that he's referring to is the feast of the Passover. And the Paschal Lamb was sacrificed at Passover. Now he tells us in the New Covenant, for our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. 
to, to celebrate the feast of the Eucharist. He also tells them in chapter, in chapter 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? What is he saying? The cup of blessing, the cup of blessing, that's the cup Jesus said, this is my blood. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? He's saying it is a participation. Look at what he's saying. Yes, it's Jesus' blood. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Yes, take it carefully. He also tells them in Corinthians 11, follow along with me. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread after he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, you always got to watch these therefores. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and the blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Notice he records that Jesus handed on to him that he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Then he commands us to do this in remembrance of me. Now I see why the Catholic Church as a Holy Eucharist at every Mass, every day, in 3,000 languages all over the world. Jesus commands to do this in memory. And he's, in the same way, the cup, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Then he tells us, for as often as you eat it and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. It's like saying, sure, I believe. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. But while I believe, while I'm waiting, I'm receiving what he ordered. I'm celebrating the Passover meal, fulfilled into the Eucharist. I'm celebrating the new covenant. I'm receiving this covenant each time I go to Mass and receive the Eucharist. I'm participating. It's one step deeper than saying, yeah, I believe. Sure, I believe. Paul also mentions, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and the blood of our Lord. A person should examine himself. What does he mean by that? Be careful. You're about to receive Jesus. Are you prepared to receive him? Are you prayerful? Do you have mortal sin on your soul? Have you confessed your sins? Have you fasted for one hour? You're about to receive Jesus. Be careful. It comes with conditions. We talked about an old covenant in the Bible. Where can we find this old covenant? Jesus gives us a new covenant. Look back at Exodus 24, verse 6 through eight. Moses takes the book of the covenant. He read it out loud to the people. And his people answered, all that the Lord has said, we will heed and do. Then he took blood from a sacrificed animal. He sprinkled it, sprinkled it on the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. This is the old covenant. Blood was shed. Blood's always shed with a covenant. It's sealed with a covenant. This time it's sealed with Jesus' blood, God's blood. It's an everlasting, permanent covenant, and we can partake of it. I'd like to encourage you to continue reading and studying. Some really good information can be found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 7. I'm not going to read it all to you because it's long if you finish an entire, an entire book. It's very important that you read this. It goes like this. For if that first covenant had been faultless, no place would have been sought for a second one. But he finds fault with them and says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will continue a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. For they did not stand my covenant, and I ignored them, says the Lord. But this is a covenant I will establish with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write 
them upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is saying the prophecy of Jeremiah has been fulfilled in the new covenant. Continue reading also in Hebrews 9. There's quite a bit more. Some really, really good information in there. I encourage you to, to keep doing this. I want to bring up a point that uh, we've been reading from the Bible and following the Bible all the way through. And I wanted to just give a brief history on the Bible to, to help you with placing it in Christianity and where it belongs. Scholars estimate that Jesus died in or around 33 A.D. But the Bible wasn't compiled until 382 A.D. or somewhere around there. There were many hundred years that the church didn't have the Bible to guide them. But the church began soon after Jesus' death. The church began at Pentecost. So the church existed many hundreds of years before the Bible was compiled. The Bible was assembled by the Catholic Church as a support mechanism for the church that was already 350 years old. During these years before the Bible, the church fathers followed Jesus' example with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And they practiced their Christianity by the breaking of the bread. We know this because these church fathers wrote their teachings down and the early church fathers believed and taught that Jesus is really, truly present in the Eucharist. Do you think it would be important to know what these early church fathers taught and believed? The church has preserved these documents through the years and refers to them as sacred tradition. We have access on the internet. If you'll go to www.catholic.com, you can, you can find and search what the early fathers taught on many things, not just the Eucharist, but on baptism. And it's important to know, what did they do? 100 years or 20 years or 50 years or 200 years after Jesus died. What did they practice? It's been estimated that over half of all Catholics don't believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. And that's sad. I want to really hammer this point down. Once we see the entire plan of God and His master plan for salvation, we can see that Jesus is truly present. The early church fathers believed it, and they passed it on to us. And we need to study it, learn it, and to accept it and practice it. I'd like to ask you a question. Can the redemption of mankind be obtained by participating in a sacred meal? Just as sin entered all mankind through the sin of one man, Adam, redemption for mankind is offered through one perfect sacrifice, Jesus to say he died for me is a powerful and accurate statement, but I believe to include how he died for me needs to be addressed. At his death, he fulfilled the old covenant and became the perfect sacrifice of the new covenant. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. From the time of Moses in Exodus through the New Testament, it is obvious that God has a master plan for the forgiveness of sins and for our salvation. This master plan is being fulfilled every day. Because of the way the gospel writers record in which the way Jesus handled the bread, he took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. As Christians, we should listen to this message and hear the word of the Bible, read the word of God, and celebrate the feast of the new covenant as it is intended and ordered by Jesus. The feast of the Passover was established by God to prepare mankind to later receive the true Passover sacrifice of God himself dying for us. And Jesus is the, the Passover lamb of the new covenant. Now Jesus could have died any day of the year that he wanted to. But he didn't choose just any day. He chose to die at Passover. His death at Passover was intended and well planned. He fulfills the old covenant Passover meal, and the night before he dies, he institutes a new covenant. Then he commands us to do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, it should be easy to see why the Catholic Church celebrates Holy Communion in every Catholic Church every day in more than 3,000 languages. Each time that I participate in Mass, 
I am more aware of the teachings of the church. When I receive Holy Communion, I try to focus on the fact that I am living in the new covenant. I want to do my part in this new covenant. But just what is my part? The Lamb of God has been sacrificed and the church has empowered its priest through the words of consecration and the presence of the Holy Spirit to change ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. So just what is my part? It is to eat the lamb and drink his blood. Just like in the first Passover meal, the escape from the angel of death was to gather your family together and celebrate a meal and to mark your doorway with the blood of the lamb. Then you had to eat the lamb. This perpetual institution ordered by God continues in the church today as we gather our family together to celebrate the meal of the Eucharist. We mark ourselves with the blood of the lamb and then we eat his flesh, the bread of life. This is a food that endures for eternal life. Each time when the priest holds up the Eucharist and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, happy are we who are called to this supper. I will respond, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Thank you for taking time to listen to this message. I'm pretty sure that everyone listening has a special person in mind that they would like to share this message with. I want to challenge you to share and teach it to them. We're all called to share our faith. By the authority given to you in baptism, share this message. Pray for the courage to sit down with this person and go online and pull up www.thefourthcup.com and share this message with someone. Sit down with them, print the handout, and show it to them. This could be the most important 90 minutes that you, that you share with someone that you love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.